What's up future respiratory therapists? In this video, we're breaking down a scenario type exam question. You don't want to miss it. Let's dive in. Okay, future respiratory therapists, we're going to break down a scenario in this video. And what the purpose of this is, is for you to start recognizing and understanding how to approach and attack these scenario based questions, especially as some of you may be preparing for your TMC. And you may not even know you're preparing for your TMC, but all of you are. If you're in your first semester, you are preparing for an accumulative final called the NBRC Therapist Multiple Choice Exam. If you're in your fourth semester, you are preparing for this exam coming up in a very uh, short few months. Okay? So, you got to understand that you have to be able to start reasonably breaking these type of scenario questions down. That's what we're about to do now. Now watch what happens here. Here's the, here's the information we're given. And the question only states this. It says, consider the following. Okay, we'll consider. And what it tells us is that we have vent settings and we have patient data. We have two different elements here that we need to consider. We have a patient on volume control, SIMV. We have a patient with a set tidal volume of 550 milliliters. That's 0.55 liters. We have a set rate of eight. We have a total rate of 12. And we have a pressure support of 18 with a total minute ventilation of 11.6. Now, this is true. This is what the scenario gives us. It doesn't matter if it makes sense or not. That's what the scenario tells us. The, the scenario goes on to tell us that on our patient data side, they tell us our heart rate is 84, our blood pressure is 120 over 80, our temperature is 98.6, and our SpO2 is 99%. And then it gives us this capnometry, which shows a decreasing in tidal CO2. This is important. We have a decreasing in tidal CO2. Now, before we get into the answers, Let's talk about decreasing end tidal CO2. There's only four things. One, hyperventilation. If your patient is hyperventilating, that might cause a decrease in your end tidal CO2. Two, if your patient has a decrease in metabolism, so this comes back to all your metabolic information, things like temperature, muscle activity, and things like that. But a decrease in temperature, a decrease in muscle activity will decrease your metabolic rate, decrease your metabolism, decrease the consumption of oxygen, which will decrease a production of CO2. Therefore, you will get a decrease in your entitled CO2. Three, a reduction in cardiac output if your patient has a, a a dropping blood pressure or a decreasing cardiac output then obviously less co2 is going to be being brought back to the lungs which is going to decrease your entitled co2 okay and then number four here is an increase in dead space now when we say increase in dead space multiple things come to light here. We might be talking about a pulmonary embolism. We might be talking about an emphysematic, okay? We might be talking about excessive PEEP, which will reduce uh, pulmonary capillary blood flow and make ventilation in excess of perfusion. So we have an increase in our VQ ratio. Anything that causes an increase in our VQ ratio might cause our dead space I mean, our, our entitled CO2 to decrease. So here's where we are. We know that these things might happen. I'm going to clear the board here because I want to start over from scratch. Okay, so let's look at what the question asks. We know we have a decreasing entitled CO2, and the question asks us which of the following statements might be true. Now, this is going to require you to break down each question it's a multiple choice exam but this is actually more like a multiple multiple question okay you have to break down each answer and go okay that one's false that one's 
false, that one's false. There's only one true answer here, and that's the answer. So let's look at it. So when we look at this, we say, okay, which of the following statements might be true? Well, the first one says paralyzing agents have been discontinued, thus causing an increased metabolism. Now, if you will remember, what we just stated is, is that an increase in metabolism will lead to an increase in oxygen consumption and an increase in CO2 production. That would cause an increase in your end tidal CO2, not a decrease. So this answer right here is simply false. Okay, when we look at the second one, it says hemodynamics appear to be abnormally low. Okay, now let's go back to our situation, back to our scenario, and see if this is true. Are our hemodynamics abnormally low? Well, when we talk about hemodynamics, we're talking about BP, heart rate, cardiac output, things like that. Nothing here seems out of whack. Nothing here seems to be abnormal. Nothing here seems to be especially abnormally low. So that can't be true. We have a normal blood pressure. We have a normal heart rate. We're not giving any other data over cardiac output or hemodynamics. So we have to assume at this point that with the data that has been given, which is key, you have to use the data that is given and not read into the scenario and try to make up something, okay? So from what we have, our hemodynamic status is stable. So that makes question number two here, or answer number two, false. It's not true, okay? Now, that leaves two answers. Answer number C says the pressure support should be decreased. Well, wait a second. I've already forgot what the pressure support was. So let's go back and look at the pressure support. We'll bring our data back here and we go, okay, pressure support is 18. Now that seems excessive right now. And so perhaps the pressure support is excessive and perhaps we need to decrease it. Let's put a question mark by that answer and see if that comes out to be the right one. I'm going to go back to our, back to our answers. So we're going to put a question mark here. And then the last one is there is a decrease in dead space. Well, if you remember, I said that an increase in dead space will cause your end tidal CO2 to go down. Not a decrease in dead space. This says a decrease in dead space. So if we have a decrease in dead space, we would not expect to have a decrease in entitled CO2. So this question is also, or this answer is also obviously wrong. That only leaves one option. And the best answer here is that we need to decrease our pressure support. But before I let you go, I want to illustrate to you on how we know that the pressure support is too high or excessive, okay? So let's go back to our data. I want to show you guys something. I'm going to get rid of some of this and just give you guys the data again, okay? So we have SIMV. Now this is important. When we're talking about spontaneous tidal volume, we have to be talking about a vent mode that allows spontaneous breathing. SIMV is one of those modes. If you're in assist control, you're not talking about spontaneous tidal volume because spontaneous tidal volume isn't happening in assist control. You have to understand that. But when we are in SIMV, which is what we are in, then now we understand that, okay, the patient can breathe spontaneously. Now, if the patient can breathe spontaneously, we have to understand as respiratory therapists that we can augment this spontaneous breathing with pressure support. And we have a pressure support of 18. Now, right off the bat, that seems excessive. But I'm going to show you how we prove that it's excessive, okay? And to do so, you have to assess spontaneous tidal volume. I'm going to say that again. To assess the adequacy of pressure support, you have to assess spontaneous tidal volume. Now, how do we do that in SIMV? That's what I'm about to show you. Let me um, 
show you guys a little trick on how we break down and how to ask ourselves what is the patient spontaneous tidal volume if i was to ask you that right now if i was to say what's the average spontaneous tidal volume some of you would just say 11.6 divided by 12 and you would get something like i don't know let's see what we would get so 11.6 11.6 divided by 12 would give us 966. Now, that's not the answer. That's not the average spontaneous tidal volume. That is average tidal volume between what is set and what is being generated by the patient. Okay, so let me show you a little table that you can use in clinical practice while you're working with SIMV and learning how to use it and how you can assess your patient's spontaneous tidal volume. I'm going to show you something that you already remember and you already know. Respiratory rate times tidal volume equals minute volume. We already know this. Okay, this is true. When you're in a mode that allows the patient to breathe spontaneously, you have to understand that there is a portion that belongs to the ventilator and there is another portion that belongs to the patient. And when you add those two portions together, you will get a total. Okay, so what I'm saying here is you have vent plus spontaneous equals total. Okay, that's what I'm trying to say. Now watch, all we're going to do here is make a nice little table out of this. And then draw a rectangle, come back over here. And then I'm going to draw lines like this. I'm going to separate patient. I mean the ventilator from the spontaneous. I'm going to separate respiratory rate from tidal volume and minute ventilation. And now we have a nice little table. Now all we have to do here is fill the table in. Okay. So let's go back to the scenario and see what we know for a fact. Okay. We know when it comes to respiratory rate, we have a set rate of eight and a spontane or a total rate of 12. Okay. Okay, so let's come back here. Set rate of eight, total of 12. We're gonna stop right there. We're also gonna look at tidal volume. What do we know about tidal volume? Okay, well when we look at our tidal volume, we know that we have a set tidal volume of 550 milliliters. It doesn't tell us anything else about tidal volume. So all we know is that our tidal volume is 550 milliliters. Now I'm going to go ahead and turn this into liters. So this is going to be 0.55 liters and that's just my preference. You can leave it in milliliters, but you have to understand if you leave it in milliliters, when you get to minute ventilation, you have to turn it into liters because nobody talks about minute ventilation in milliliters. Okay. So we know that. Now let's talk about minute ventilation. What do we know about minute ventilation? Well, let's go back and look at our scenario. Okay, so we have a tidal volume, respiratory rate, total respiratory rate, pressure support, total minute ventilation. We know our total is 11.6. Okay, let's come back here. We're gonna put 11.6 liters here because that is our total. And we know that because that's what it told us. Okay, now watch what happens here. All we have to do now is fill in the blank squares. I call this respiratory therapy Sudoku. All you have to do is fill in the squares because we know formulas from this point. Okay, we know that if the total rate is 12 and the vent is providing eight of those, then the patient must be making up the other four. This is true. Now, we can't do anything with tidal volume yet, but we do know that respiratory rate times tidal volume equals minute ventilation. So we know that if we have a set rate of eight times a tidal volume of 0.55, that the vent is providing 4.4 liters per minute. Okay. 4.4 liters per minute. Now watch this. Our total minute ventilation is 11.6. If 4.4 of that is coming from the ventilator, then that means the rest of it is coming from 
the spontaneous ventilation efforts from our patient. So all we have to do now is go 11.6 minus 4.4, and that gives us 7.2 liters. That means that of this 11.6, 7.2 of it is coming from the patient's spontaneous efforts. So what's their average tidal volume? Well, if we know that respiratory rate times tidal volume equals minute ventilation, then we also know that minute ventilation divided by respiratory rate will give us tidal volume. So all we have to do now is 7.2 divided by 4 is 1.8 liters. That's 1,800 milliliters per spontaneous tidal volume. 1,800 milliliters, 1.8 liters with each breath that this patient is taking. What does that tell us? Tells us that those spontaneous tidal volumes of 1.8 liter are excessive. And what do we need to do? Why are they excessive? Well, it appears to be that you have some healthy lungs here. And the pressure support, which was what? Pressure support was 18. So if pressure support is 18, and with that 18, we're getting 1.8 liters, well, that obviously is an excessive tidal volume as a result of the excessive pressure support. That's why this patient is hyperventilating, because their spontaneous tidal volumes are being augmented excessively by the excessive pressure support creating a tidal volume, spontaneous tidal volume of 1.8 liters. And the answer here is, is that the pressure support is excessive and should be decreased. That is why this patient is hyperventilating. Now, a lot of you are probably wondering, like, well, what goes in this box right here? Nothing. This is a nothing box. There is no such thing as a total tidal volume. So nothing goes in this box. But you can fill out the rest of this box anytime you have a patient on SIMV because you have to separate what the ventilator is doing from what the patient is doing. And that's my point here. Okay. So the answer, we go back to the scenario here. Which of these statements is true? The answer is we have we have a pressure support that is set excessively and the pressure support should be decreased. That is what is driving our CO2 down. And in this case, we need to decrease our pressure support. We probably need to do an SBT and get this patient extubated. That's the truth, okay? But for this scenario, you take what's given and you answer it appropriately. Hey guys, I hope this helps. If it does, Put a comment below. Let me know what you liked about it. Let me know if you have any questions, any comments, any concerns. I'll address them. And in the meantime, go be great.